Hello. This video is going to be about Yugoslavia, the Tournapolia camp, Count Dankula, and the issue of free speech, and maybe a few other things as well. And it's going to be about a long defunct magazine called Living Marxism, which started to shed its Marxism ideas and uh, it became LM magazine, which was in many ways a free speech organ and I used to read it quite a lot. I thought it was very good. In August 1992, a party of British journalists went to the Tunapolia camp in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Some of you may recall that there was a civil war there uh, which broke out in the wake of the disintegration of Yugoslavia, a dis disintegration which in itself was triggered by the death of the leader of Yugoslavia, the communist strongman Marshal Tito, who'd been in power since 1943. He died in 1980, and although Yugoslavia limped on for a few more years, like the light still reaching our eyes from a long dead star, without Tito's dictatorial powers, the disparate group of Muslims Croats, Serbs, Bosnians, Slovenes uh, and Albanians just couldn't keep it together and the country disintegrated. From 1991 to 1999 there was a series of horrendously brutal civil wars with Things like snipers machine gunning ordinary people in the streets, you know, women carrying babies, kids carrying water because a lot of the infrastructure had gone, old men with bags of groceries. You'd have to hold a pathological level of hate to do that, uh, but that's what was showing up on all sides. There was not one which was worse than the other, although the Serbs came in for more opprobrium than the others, mainly because of one particularly striking episode when, in July 1995, 8,000 Bosniak boys and men were killed in the area of Srebrenica, a place name which has since become notorious. See, I didn't have any trouble remembering the pronunciation of that name. But then there were Bosnian Muslim war crimes as well, including beheadings. Most of these killings were subsequently blamed on foreign jihadis who'd come in on the conflict, but that's hardly an excuse. They did have commanding officers after all. The whole repellent mess is an object lesson in what happens when different groups are forced together under severe controls and then the severe controls suddenly lose their grip. It's a lesson we might all learn about multiculturalism, but it holds another lesson as well, because what happened afterwards is a warning for our own society and the issue of free speech. Tito's government stopped inter-ethnic conflict by means of an efficient military, a powerful police force, and a set of laws which kept every citizen firmly in his or her place. And that's where we are heading now. We're going that way ourselves as laws to do with freedom of expression are slowly tightened in the service of keeping the peace. And we're frightened into compliance by that very mantra. Sometimes I feel a bit like one of those situations in Star Trek, you know, the sort of thing. The, the Enterprise comes across a, a capsule and in it the captain of an exploded starship or, or the leader of a destroyed planet has sent a message warning about some deadly danger ahead. And here I am in Britain and this message is a warning to all you guys in the United States. Don't go down this path. When freedom of speech is taken away, it's never given back except by force, uh, and even then, generally, the lawmakers of any revolution turn out as restrictive as the lawmakers they've overcome. 
So I wouldn't rely on the sudden uh, boiling up of the population to uh, get our free speech back. I don't know what's going to happen with it. In 1997, a very famous photograph changed everyone's mind about the Bosnian civil wars. Until then, the West had more or less hung fire. Some palliative aid was given to the victims, uh, but nothing much happened until this photo of a man called Fikret Ali was published. It brought to mind horrifying images of Nazi death camps. But it turns out that although the war, the battles and the atrocities were real enough, this particular picture had some questions surrounding it, somewhat like the barbed wire which was supposed to be surrounding these men and turned out not to be. The ITN team, that's a British um, television company, apparently had gone into this camp and according to the Red Cross employee here, Turn Polier was some sort of supply camp where people were going for refuge and for food. I'm not saying it was marvellous and I'm not saying there would not have been soldiers taking advantage of their five minutes of power, but it wasn't a concentration camp. The reporters found a wired off compound with most of the wire broken which, so far as has been ascertained, had been a holding pen for machinery and building materials. The wire had been there originally to stop the equipment from being stolen. The reporters then positioned their cameras inside this holding pen and behind part of the wire fence, which was still up. It was from inside this compound they then filmed the camp inmates who were outside the fence. But without the wide focus, the impression was that the men were prisoners behind wire in some sort of concentration camp. Penny Marshall, the nice blonde woman, uh, we can see in this clip. Penny Marshall had set up her cameras behind barbed wire. She was in position. Now she searched the crowd for that perfect... wrote about making that film uh, in, in the Sunday Times. She was proud that she had moved world opinion and that after the broadcast on ITN, British newspapers were calling for military intervention and that 20 minutes after the report was rebroadcast on American television, George Bush promised to press for a United Nations resolution authorising use of force. Why am I bringing this up? Well, because when a magazine called Living Marxism published an article by a reporter called Thomas Deichmann in which he wrote about the camera angles which gave what he defined as an erroneous impression, ITN immediately slapped Living Marxism with a libel suit. I was a reader at the time and I shoved as much as I could afford to their legal fund. It obviously wasn't enough. Perhaps some of you who might not have heard of this case will be surprised to hear this. ITN won. Several very well-known and highly respected writers stood up to defend LM magazine, but it didn't help. I've often speculated on how that could have happened. Can it possibly be that a government that wanted to go to war had to get an excuse for it one way or the other and the excuse had to be ironclad? That is, was there some sort of support from on high, so to speak, for the court case? It all just seems too neat somehow. Anyway, why am I bringing this up? Because tomorrow Count Dankula gets the verdict on his court case. And again, I have speculated that there's some governmental interference in it. I'm talking now about the Scottish government. In this instance, I doubt anyone will go to war over the Hitler pug. But let's face it, what happens to Dankula 
like what happened to LM Magazine, will be a warning to all of us here, all of us who want to shoot our mouths off against current orthodoxies. It's more dangerous in this country now and in almost any country in the world. America is still largely free of this restriction. You should celebrate that and hang on to it.